morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are. My name is Rod Hembry. I'm Corey. And I'm Ryan. And this is Quick Study Television. Thank you for joining us today on the weekend edition. It is very exciting. We have Corey and Ryan. They're going to be presenting material today as we bring forth this teaching. Now, what are you doing today, Corey? Well, today I'm going to be taking a look at mummification in ancient Egypt and how it crosses over with the biblical text. Very good. That's interesting. All right, we'll look forward to that. Ryan's going to be talking about what, Ryan? Well, today I'm studying a colorful little critter that brings a whole new meaning to the phrase, you are what you eat. <laughs> a colorful new critter, okay. Very good, and we're also gonna be talking about the land of Israel. A lot of people are saying, well, Israel needs to give up the land, there should be no Israel. But wait a minute, who gave the land to Israel in the first place? It actually mentions the people that he gave it to. Well, this is a very interesting study, so get your Bible and your Bible guide, it is time to move on. As we study and read through the scriptures, we've landed in the Old Testament book of Deuteronomy. Now, at this point in history, the ancient Israelites have come out of the nation of ancient Egypt, and they are beginning to build their own culture in the wilderness before they move into the taking over of the promised land that would become known as Israel. So we're still at this point uh, when Israel is very young, where she's very influenced by ancient Egypt. Take a look. There are two men in the Bible said to have been mummified or embalmed in Egypt, Jacob, known as Israel, and Joseph, his son. Genesis 50 even gives the timeline of the mummification process, 40 days for embalming plus 30 days for mourning, giving a total of 70 days, the exact number verified by ancient sources. There were a few different ways to embalm in ancient Egypt, but since Joseph was the Pharaoh's vizier, his second in command, it's safe to assume the most expensive route was taken, which is also the most well-known process. To preserve the human body after death, the brain was removed from the skull through a nostril, and the skull was rinsed out with a water-herb mixture. Next, the internal organs were removed by a cut made in the abdomen. The lungs, stomach, intestines, and liver were saved to be buried in their own jars. The body was then washed out with a special wine followed by a potent spice rinse. After cleansing, the cavity would be packed with a combination of ground spices, closed up, and the whole body would be buried in natron, a salty mineral to remove all moisture. After 40 days in the natron, the mummy was removed, cleansed, and wrapped in linen, decorated with golden jewels, and covered in a glue-like substance called bitumen. The remains would then be returned to the family, who had since made a person-shaped, decorated wooden coffin, and the mourning rituals would continue. For the ancient Egyptians, mummification was essential to their beliefs in the afterlife. For Bible students, it's an intriguing prospect that Jacob and Joseph's mummies could still be encased in Abraham's Cave of Machpelah. Now, inevitably, when we talk about mummification and we talk about Jacob and Joseph, the question arises from all of our good Christian hearts, why would Jacob and Joseph allow the Egyptians to embalm them? Why would Joseph want to embalm his father, Jacob? I mean, if they are dedicated to the God of their father, Abraham, if they are very monotheistic, then why in the world would they allow this mummification process that has undeniable ties to the pagan worship practices of ancient Egypt. Now, if we just let that sit there for a second, that's pretty uncomfortable, isn't it? Now, we have to, we have to keep in mind a couple of things here. First, yes, the scriptures are very clear that Jacob and Joseph were dedicated to the God of Abraham. Uh, however, the law of Moses had not yet been 
codified. It had not yet been given to Moses. That would come a few generations later. And then even a little bit later on, King David would say, I, I won't even say the names of pagan gods on my lips. So it became a little bit more uh, codified in its purity. But uh, I want to take a look at it from a little bit of a different angle. Jacob and Joseph, while they were dedicated to God, their Egyptian brothers whom they lived with and worked with were not. And it was a tremendous, it would have been, I can imagine, a tremendous honor to be mummified uh, like the higher classes and royalty in Egypt. And Jacob and Joseph accepted this gift from the Egyptians. Previous things are assigned to the personality and the character of God because he chose to give land to Israel. Some say that God is not faithful or right. He tends to lean on Israel as his people. Therefore, he is not a good God at all, but he's a powerful and a corrupt being. But what if that's totally false? What if the scripture, when they truly studied it, tells us something completely different. The truth is more revealing than the lies of those who hate God's actions. You see, in Deuteronomy chapter 9, the scripture is clear and concise. God's decision to take back the land for Israel was a good and a right decision. It was completely justified. However, God need not justify anything to us. He is the giver of our life. He is the reason we have the things that we have. God is our Lord and our Savior from sin, which came into being in the very first beginning of time. Deuteronomy 9, verses 1 through 6. Hear, O Israel, you are to cross over the Jordan today and go in to dispossess nations greater and mightier than yourself, cities great and fortified up to heaven, a people great and tall, the descendants of the Anakim, whom you know and of whom you heard it said, who can stand before the descendants of Anak. Therefore understand today that the Lord your God is He who goes over before you as a consuming fire. He will destroy them and bring them down before you, so you shall drive them out and destroy them quickly, as the Lord has said to you. Do not think in your heart, after the Lord your God has cast them out before you, saying, Because of my righteousness the Lord has brought me in to possess this land, but it is because of the wickedness of those nations that the Lord is driving them out from before you. It is not because of your righteousness or the uprightness of your heart that you go in to possess their land, but because of the wickedness of these nations that the Lord your God drives them out from before you, and that he may fulfill the word which the Lord swore to your fathers, to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Therefore, understand that the Lord your God is not giving you this good land to possess because of your righteousness, for you are a stiff-necked people. Deuteronomy chapter 9, verses 1 through 6. When we study the scripture, we learn so much, and it's important for us to understand that in the book of Deuteronomy, the laws of Moses, we learn about God. Janice has just read it for you and set us up to hear from the Lord. Now get your Bible guide out if you don't have one. I mean, I, I can write to us uh, in the U.S. and Canada and in Britain and uh, send an offering in any amount. It'll help us keep the lights on, which is important. The camera's running. And we'll send you a Bible guide every single month. Now go to www.biblediscoverytv.com, biblediscoverytv.com, and you can click on Donate here, make a donation. It'll take you right to the PDF files so you can get a hold of your Bible guide right away. It's all new this year. Very good. In our works of faith, I thought about this and I thought, you know, really, there's only one way to put this 
Why conquer the land? Why? Now that's a good question, but what does it mean? What does that say and, and what does it tell us? We're going to be studying Deuteronomy chapter 9 to 11 as we study the second law or the reason that Moses wrote this law was to tell the people what he thought. Looking at Deuteronomy chapter 9 verses 1 to 6, we need to focus on this. Very important that we hear it and that we listen. Now, as we do that, Father, I pray in the name of Jesus Christ that you would help us today to learn and to listen to the scripture and the way that you placed it so we can be ready, Lord, to understand what you're saying. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, with that prayer in place, and let's take a look at this. Hear, O Israel. I love when he starts like that. Deuteronomy 9, 1 and 2. Hear, O Israel. You are to cross over the Jordan today and go in to dispossess nations greater and mightier than yourself. What? Are you serious? Nations greater and nations mightier than yourself. Uh, cities great and fortified to heaven. In fact, a people great and tall, and the descendants of Anakim, who you know, and of whom you heard it said, who can stand before the descendants of Anak? Wow, that's intense, beloved. See, we have to understand something. God protects land dedicated to him. Years before, Abraham built altars to God in this land. That's what Abraham did and worshiped God. God now reclaimed the land, beloved. Now remember that when Abraham went into the land, there was nothing really there. And he built altars worshiping God and all of that. God took the land at that point. And remember, a covenant was made with Abraham. I'm going to give you this land. I'm going to give you a son. And your son's going to be as multiple as the stars in the sky. And you're going to possess this land. God already said that hundreds of years before. So we need to understand God will do what he said. Now, Israel was going into this land, and these people are greater than Israel. They're great warriors. Israel's not a warrior nation. They've been in the wilderness for 40 years. They're not going to, I mean, God has to do it. Do you see this? This is what God designed, and this is what God set up. God has to do it, and he did do it, let me tell you. We go back to chapter 9, verses 3 and 4, and it says, Therefore... Understand today that the Lord your God is he who goes before you. The Lord your God is he who goes before you as a consuming fire. He will destroy them and bring them down before you, so you shall drive them out and destroy them quickly, as the Lord has said to you. Do not think in your heart. After the Lord your God has cast them out from before you, saying, Because of my righteousness, the Lord has brought me in to possess this land. But it is because of the wickedness of these nations that the Lord is driving them out from before you. Fascinating. So here we learn something amazing. God is more powerful than anyone, anywhere, beloved. We must acknowledge that God is stronger than anything out there. Or let me say this, anything inside of us. God is the ultimate. He is the mighty one. He is the strength of everything. So we need to know that. We need to understand the reason that God did this was not because Israel was so great, but because God had seen the wickedness in the land. Remember, Abraham had built altars there and worshiped God there. So this is a major decision. You see, God sees time from beginning to end, and he sees everything. He even sees Israel right now, and he sees what's going on in the land. Trust me, God knows. God is the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow, let me tell you. Deuteronomy chapter 9, verses 5 and 6. It is not because of your righteousness... It is not because of your righteousness or the uprightness of your heart that you go in to possess their land, but because of the wickedness of these nations that the Lord your God drives them out from before you, and that he may fulfill the word which the Lord has sworn to your fathers, to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob. Therefore, 
understand that the Lord your God is not giving you this good land to possess because of your righteousness, for you are a stiff-necked people. <laughs> God is amazing. You see, God said it is not because of Israel's rightness or righteousness or rightness with God that he conquered his land again. It was because the people were evil. See, God sees everything, beloved. We need to realize, we need to understand that the decision for Israel to be Israel is not because the people are so great. It has nothing to do with that. It's because God sees that those who are there are evil. And he is going to come in. He's going to take that land. Let me tell you something. It is not over. We are in the end of time. It is not over, beloved. I want to say that very specifically. God will take over that land and you better be watching for it because it is going to happen. And may we trust God and listen to him today as he speaks. Thank you for staying with us here on Quick Study Weekend Edition. It is great as we've studied and we've looked at things. And next time on Quick Study Television, we're going to be talking about God providing a place to worship Him. In other words, you couldn't just worship God like all the others worship. You had to worship God very specifically, and He has a place for that. So we'll talk about why and what that's all about next time on Quick Study Television. Here's Ryan. In today's science report, we're exploring a type of slug called the nudibranch. Now, this abundant little creature amazingly ingests other creatures, including deadly predators, and actually uses what it's ingested as its own defense system. Let's study. You are what you eat. We've all heard this saying before. But the nudibranch takes this to the extremes. The nudibranch, a type of sea slug, will ingest sponges, anemones, barnacles, other sea slugs including their own species, and other deadly predators that most other sea creatures avoid, and then actually become what they eat. For example, some will ingest poisonous sponges, store that poison in their own bodies, and then use it for their own benefit. Others will eat jellyfish or anemones and pass their poison stingers right through their stomach and into the surface of their skin, storing them in their tentacles where they can be used for defense. Also interesting is that these tiny little alien looking life forms are one of the most common and most beautiful in the world. Nudibranchs are gastropods, which means stomach foot, and there are more than 60,000 named species of gastropods living everywhere, land and sea. The nudibranch lives in oceans and saltwater seas all over the world, and there are more than 3,000 known species. They also come in many different shapes and colors. They can be round or flat or short or long. And while some fall into the background using camouflage, others sport vast and vivid colors like bright green polka dots or colorful blue stripes. Although nudibranchs, meaning naked gill, do not have fish-like gills, they do have tentacle-like bulges on their back that they breathe through. They also have very small eyes embedded on their back, which can perceive light and darkness. However, they get around mainly by smell and feel. The two horns on their head, called rhinophores, are chemical scanners that can alert them of approaching predators, guide them to food or to other nudibranchs. In fact, occasionally they will follow the slime trail of another slug or change direction 
if the chemicals of the slime indicates danger. Although they have shells at birth, they eventually give it up, relying instead on their much more sophisticated weapons. This humble little sea slug showcases the incredible handiwork of the creator, as well as his love for beauty. It's designs and creatures like this that remind us that there has to be a creator. I believe this is part of what the Apostle Paul was talking about. He said in Romans 1, 19 and 20, For what can be known about God is plain to mankind, because God has shown it to them. For his invisible attributes, namely his eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world, in things that have been made. So they are without excuse. I pray we all take this passage to heart and proclaim God as creator of all things instead of pretending that he doesn't exist. That's interesting, Ryan. Man is without excuse. And uh, the, the idea of the stars telling us uh, that you know, God existed and all of that is fascinating. I've read several books on it and uh, it really is true. Apparently today, about 85% of the world cannot see the stars because of light in the city, light pollution, and all of that. And so it's like the enemy has eliminated that message. But for many years, people used to look at the stars and they mm -hmm. corrupted it with astrology, of course. And uh, But it's fascinating that God has made a way for everybody everywhere to know he is God. Absolutely. And you know what? We're so... You know, we have all these cities and everything, and, you know, we don't really get out and see nature a lot of times. And so sometimes that blinds us to the reality that there really is a creator. You know, all you have to do is just go out a little bit, you know, into the world. <laughs> go, go out a little bit. <laughs> I, you know, it's true. I mean, I, I've got my telescope and, uh, you know, 20 years ago, well, 20 years ago, we I had a different telescope, but we were near a city and uh, I would just move out a little bit from the city and go to the Christian school, actually. And I would set up my telescope and see, but I was noticing that there's lights all over the place at the Christian school. Mm -hmm. And I can't do that. I got to find another place out further and further. The more lights and the LED lights that they're putting in place, that's the problem because those things are so bright. And uh, it's absolutely fascinating. Mm -hmm. Very, very interesting. Corey, I was going to ask you a question because you mentioned something that I, I can't wrap my mind around because it's everything's Jewish these days. <laughs> because everybody's thinking... When we're looking at the Old Testament and the And New everybody's Testament. thinking Jewish, 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 We're right? studying because they're Jewish scriptures. We're studying that culture, yeah. But there's two people here that, you know, J Jacob and uh, Joseph... Yeah. They were embalmed? Yeah, we know for sure they were embalmed. Uh, there the could Egyptian be more. way. There, there could be more. Yeah, there could be more. I mean, um, you know, there's some traditions that say Joseph's sons went into, uh, went into the Egyptian kind of political sphere too. We don't know for sure. That's just tradition. But, but yeah, I mean, Egypt left its mark on Israel, and, and that makes a lot of sense. I mean, they lived there. They, they were born there. They died there, and then they finally came out of there. But um, we see Egyptian influences all over uh, the Old Testament of the Bible, especially Exodus through Deuteronomy. And even in the time period of the kings, the more archaeologists are, are bringing out of the ground, the more imagery we're seeing that just reinforces that this was a culture created in Egypt. And, and that just makes sense. You know, and it reminds me, our culture too, good, bad, and indifferent, our cultures uh, make impressions on who we are as people too. But God still meets us at that place, no matter what our culture is. He can meet us and he can teach us with that culture and even despite that culture. And I find that to be a really interesting and fabulous characteristic of God. This is the amazing thing because there's certain things that every culture has in common. The sun. Uh, everybody yeah. knows that the sun comes up. And, human nature. Yeah, <laughs> we'll human nature, that. right? And, and everybody <laughs> knows rain, you know, nature, water. Nature, yes. We and uh, so we got the sun, we've got the water, we've got clouds. Everybody knows clouds. And everybody knows stars. Mm -hmm. And so these, but these, this is fascinating because these are the things that the Bible uses to explain who God is. Mm -hmm. That is absolutely stunning. Amazing. Anyway, that's amazing. This, the, anyway, I need to tell you this, the No Mere Book, okay? Ryan made a DVD and I cannot believe what he did. Ryan, what did you do on this <laughs> DVD? Well, yeah, it's a bit of a personal investigation. You know, I've had people say to me, Ryan, why do you spend so much time 
studying the Bible. I mean, it's just like all the other religious books. And so, you know, I offered up a challenge and I said, no, it's, it's definitely not like all the other religious books. And this, in this presentation, that's what I go through. I demonstrate that the Bible is truly supernatural in origin. And there's many things that we could talk about, you know, advanced medical, uh, medical procedures in the Bible, advanced science, all well ahead of its time. How do you explain that? I mean, thousands of years That's before we made question. these discoveries. How do you explain that? You can't. Uh, and in fact, uh, it's fascinating that you did this because you've made this presentation, uh, and I saw it, and it is amazing. And this DVD is available, Corey. We write, people can write in and send a gift of yep. $25 or more mm -hmm. uh, to the ministry that keeps the lights on and mm -hmm. that keeps the cameras going and all of that. And we'll send this DVD to them. And I mention this because a lot of people do send more than $25 in when you do that. When you do, thank you so much. It helps us tremendously. But this DVD is stunning. And I don't know of too many people or other ministries that have a DVD talking about the exclusive presentation of the Bible itself. And that's something that God did. So you can write to us at any of the addresses. We have three addresses. We have an American address. We have a Canadian address and a British address. And, uh, and or you can write to us at the uh, website, www.biblediscoverytv.com. Bible Discovery TV. Now remember, you have to put the TV in there. Bible Discovery TV. A lot of people forget the TV. Don't forget the TV, the Bible Discovery TV. Very, very important. And I need to remind you, as I always do at this time, God is real. And in this program, I hope and I trust that God has spoken to you. And if he has, the reason he spoke to you is because he loves you. And if you've never made Jesus Christ the Lord of your life, this is the time to do that. Jesus Christ came 2,000 years ago, died on the cross, and he rose again. That he did by himself in the flesh. And he said, come to me, all you who are heavy laden and burdened with religion and all of this other stuff. I will give you rest. If we pray and say, Jesus Christ, be my Lord, then he will come in. And if we're serious about it, he will change our life because we love Jesus Christ more than we love our sin. Sin is a horrible thing. Jesus Christ did something about that. Today, pray to Jesus.